is a lot right now. Are you feeling it? We all need new tools to help us walk through the chaos with grace, ease, and compassion for each other and for ourselves. In this podcast, you'll hear from parents, educators, and other experts who can bring perspective to the monumental job of parenting. It's time to level up and be warriors for our kids and our communities. This is the Warrior Parent Podcast. I'm Marcy Mitchell. And I'm Debbie DeMano. As parents, we understand that it really does take a village to raise our kids. We hope that this podcast serves to create and support that community for you. Join us as we discuss and practice our core tools, which are proven mind-body techniques that can be used by anyone to improve your life on a daily basis. Welcome back to the Warrior Parent Podcast. Today, we're talking with Dr. Elena Johnson, who is a psychologist with over 20 years clinical experience. As a parent of three offspring who are passionate about the performing arts, she recognizes the lack of resources for parents of teens and tweens with similar interests. This led her to found Parenting Talent LLC as a support resource for parents, instructors, mentors, and studio owners dedicated to empowering young people in their creative exploration. In addition, she coaches teens and young adults in the arts to have a healthy, happy, balanced, and productive relationship with their art. Dr. Elaine is the author of Parenting Talent, The Grown-Up's Guide to Supporting Creatively Driven Teens and Tweens, which helps parents, mentors, and organizations navigate the emotional and practical needs of tweens and teens in the arts. So welcome so much, Dr. Elena. Well, thank you so much for having me. Yay. Okay, this is a subject that's near and dear to Marcy and my heart. So we have this we have this belief that there's these generations of younger kids coming up through our involvement as human beings and they are wonderfully creative like like more than we have ever known and we feel like it is our job to uh to help to transport <laughs> these kids into the new generations and stop the older generations i.e. our generations um from sort of disabling them from you know, no, you can't do that. No, you got to go get a nine to five. No, don't be creative. And we're telling all the OGs um, to stop it <laughs> and, to, and to let their their, their wonderful creativity um, shine. And so we're so happy to have found you because like I said, we're, we're, we're super passionate about this thing. Marcy's got a bunch of artsy kids in her family too. <laughs> Marcy probably wouldn't say she's creative, but I've just heard her start singing <laughs> in the chorus <laughs> in like the last year and that girl can sing. And she, we have a platform for uh, creativity, for journaling and all that. And she works and creates all of that herself. So, mm-hmm. so anyway, um, Without further ado, please tell us um, how you became so passionate um, about the arts and the creativity. I know you've also um, published a book, so um, hopefully you can wind all those pieces together and, and give us an intro. Me too. And I'm so excited to hear that you are on my team in terms of kind of trying to... <laughs> maybe shift some misconceptions or anxieties or fears and really encouraging our our young people to lean into what they love. And, you know, as parents, we really want our children to be in careers that they enjoy and they're passionate about and they feel good about. You don't want to think Mm -hmm. of your kid by 30 waking up and already, you know, on Sunday having a case of the Mondays. So (laughs) I am very much about supporting them to explore and they have time. They have time if if it it doesn't go the way they want to. So just Mm -hmm. letting them do that. So a little bit about me and how I got here. So I'm a clinical psychologist, as you mentioned, by trade. And um, while I was um, undergoing my training, I kind of had these two separate interests that I didn't even realize at some point I'd really bring together in this way, of course. But um, I was training in a pediatric hospital. So I did a lot of stuff with children and teens. Mm -hmm. Um, But I also, my dissertation was on motherhood. 
So I did already have kind of these two interests that were kind of happening at the same time. A few years later, I got married and became a mom myself. And um, at one point I looked up and I had these three boys and my bad, because I know better, but I think in my mind, without even consciously processing it, I just assumed, oh, it's going to be all sports all the time. Great. No problem. And I had this vision of we'll have the minivan and we'll be putting all of the sports equipment in the back of it and going to all the games. <laughs> and that was going to be our world. And I, I was there for it. I, I had no problem with it. And I, um, I played the flute, um, never professionally or anything like that, but I did see the value of learning an instrument. So it was very important to me that all three of my boys learned to play an instrument. I figured piano really good, you know, that way you're going to learn how to read music well. And so we had a piano and I kind of said, you know, I want you each to learn it. My oldest started a little bit late, um, just based on when we got the piano and he took to it very easily. Never had to really nag him about practicing. He, he did it on his own. I would find him playing around on it at times, but he was definitely a sports kid. And that's what his peers were doing. And he was very good at sports. And so didn't really give it much thought how easily he had taken to the piano. Mm -hmm. Then there's my middle son. Um, he's the one, he's the one <laughs> in so many ways. Um, so he's the middle he, child. <laughs> yes. I say he's the perfect middle child. You will not forget he's here. Yes. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I, by then I had had my third child and I remember, I think I was feeding him or something and talking to my husband and all of a sudden we heard what we thought was my oldest, who would have been about seven and a half at the time singing, actually belting in mm -hmm. tune. And, and we were taken aback, like, oh my God, we didn't know he could sing. So my husband peeks his head out, looks and comes back with this odd look on his face and goes, that was the middle one. <laughs> I was like, wait, what? He's not, he's not even quite three yet. I don't know. Wow. And that's, that has been him from day one. So just like I said, with boys, when his peers, when my middle one's peers were all starting sports, we said, Hey, you know, you, you're, everybody's going to be starting little league. Would you like to try it? And he gave us a look and said, why would I want to play a game where people throw a ball at your head? We should have known. Funny. <laughs> he finally at some point when he realized most of his friends were playing some kind of sport when it was time for soccer he's like okay at least that's not obviously throwing a ball at my head so he decided he would try it and I remember very clearly sitting on the bleachers with my husband joking with some friends behind us I was like you know my child is the one who will be out there picking daisies and I was very wrong to give him credit <laughs> I forgot we don't have daisies. We have dandelions. So yeah. it was dandelions yeah. that he was making in the field. And I do have a picture of it. Yeah. yeah. So by this, yeah, it was kind of like he he did play and he's very athletic. So he played the first half, but then it was like he kind of looked around like, okay, I'm hot, I'm sweaty. That, like that's good. I'm done. That's so <laughs> he was out. So with him, we very quickly realized he was, you know, a very obvious singer, dancer, actor man. And the other thing you should know about him, he is the one who at three and a half came to me and said, can you get me an agent? And I said, you, I don't think you know what that is. Like, no, right? Wow. So I picked my jaw up off the floor. I say, be careful what you say. Just going to put that out there. Be very careful what you say. I said, mm -hmm. mm, honey, you know, I don't think so. Those kids are kind of weird and their parents, they're, they're weirder. They're just, no, no. <laughs> Fast forward three and a half years later, when I'm closing my successful private practice to take my child to New York to play young Simba on Broadway as the weirder Ooh. parent who would upend her entire life and our entire family life. Ooh, yeah. My husband in there, he was, he was in agreement. <laughs> follow your dreams. We already follow your dreams and passions kind of yes. kid uh, family. So he, he did eventually, he begged for years. We finally gave in and things moved very quickly for him once we uh, agreed to that. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and ironically, again, I remember thinking, well, we live in Chicago, how much can really happen? And then here we are going to New York. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> uh, my, meanwhile, the baby is kind of coming up and he, um, who's not a baby anymore, but the youngest was coming up and 
I think for him, it was a little bit of, he was kind of watching his brothers and they were having a lot of fun. And by then, once my middle son did get representation here locally, he was, the youngest one was getting dragged to his auditions. Mm. So this is pre-COVID. So this was, you know, you were going in person and you were in the car and sometimes it was, it's nothing like LA, but you were still <laughs> sometimes in the car 45 <laughs> minutes to go a few miles yeah. if it was rush hour. So yeah. I think he kind of looked around and said, well, this is kind of fun and I kind of like this and I wouldn't mind doing this. So he um, also, well, he didn't actually seek representation. It kind of <laughs> fell into his lap, but he was doing it. Asked the oldest if he wanted to do the acting thing in the same way. He said no. But meanwhile, my oldest had asked for a guitar because he wanted to teach himself how to play. Had uh, We are very, very fortunate. We live in an area that very much supports the arts. Mm -hmm. And so when he um got to a certain age he could participate in our middle school's musical theater program even though he wasn't there yet and we said great it's a great program awesome but still didn't really understand kind of where some of his talents were and he came home with a part and we were, were going you can sing <laughs> he can sing <laughs> and he did very well in that program he had leads quite frequently um, after about six months of trying to teach himself to play guitar, he asked if he could take lessons and he mm -hmm. never looked back. He is a guitarist. He is now a young adult. He is making a career as a musician. He's mm -hmm. enjoying every minute of it. My middle one um, has always been a singer and an actor, loves them both. The youngest is, he, my, my kids a little bit too stereotypically tend to follow the oldest, middle, youngest. My youngest mm -hmm. is my little bit of a rebel, a little bit <laughs> Mr. Pushback a little bit. He quit piano for drums, but okay. <laughs> you're, you're, you're continuing yeah. to play, so we're happy. While all of this was going on, there was something I was noticing. There were a lot of questions that were coming up. I'm a researcher by heart, obviously. I have a doctorate. You have to like research if you're going to do that. Mm -hmm. And so when I realized that all of my kids were kind of leaning into this super creative world, I was like, hmm, okay, how do I nurture this? What, what should I do? What, what am I, Is there something I should be doing that I'm not doing? So I start researching and what happens is I find lots of information on how to get your kids to be creative, but not a lot about what to do with kids who are already creative. That That is not an issue. We have creativity oozing here. That is not a concern. <laughs> yeah. So as I'm watching this happen and I'm looking at them and I'm kind of doing some research and finding what I can, and I'm kind of combining that knowledge with what I know as a clinician. And I've worked with a lot of teens at, at that point in my private practice, and then talking to a lot of parents, um, doesn't matter what the activity is. We all know if you have kids in an activity, you tend to spend a lot of time outside of that activity, sitting around waiting for your kid. You get to know the other parents, you end up talking. <laughs> right. And so a lot of the same questions were coming up. I was seeing the same, this, this theme that was happening over and over and over again. And when my middle son went to New York, suddenly we're with, with all the Broadway kids. But in that, in being around that, I realized the questions were exactly the same. It didn't matter what level these kids were doing it. This is just a creative, creative mind kind of question or concern. And so I found myself answering questions for parents quite frequently, like, well, my kid says they love it but I'm not sure if that's true because they won't practice or they won't do the one thing they're supposed to, or in musical theater, it might be, well, you know, they're really strong in these two areas, but they really need to learn to dance, but they won't take the dance class. And I, that's, that, that tells me they're not very serious. Mm -hmm. And I would jump in sometimes and say, I've seen your kid. I know your kid's passionate. I know, I know they love this. I don't think that's quite what's going on. And I would kind of give them my take on that. Like in that case, often it was perfectionism. They loved it so much. They yeah. were fearful of doing the part that they weren't as good at. Yeah. So that kind of kept them, you know, so frozen almost. Right. And when I would put it that way to parents, they'd go, oh, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So through all of that in the back of my mind, I kind of said, you know, this should, all, this information needs to be in one location. This all mm -hmm. needs to be put together. And that is where eventually the book came to be. So yeah. That is a not super short, but a, a, wow. a pretty decent summary fascinating of how journey, I got. though. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Con yes. Congratulations on all of that for sure, for sure. You know, I have a of a question for you. So um, last week, I think it was last week, Marcy and I had um, a teacher, a local, uh, uh, is he middle school, no fifth grade teacher, I guess, mm -hmm. and um, he had grown up. Um, also, his whole family is artists. They're musicians. They've grown up in theater. Yeah. He went to UCLA. 
um, you know, was out acting, doing all the things. And he finally just got tired of waiting tables. I mean, he was, he was working, but um, also waiting tables was getting old. So he decided to go back to school to become, um, become a teacher um, to, to do something more purposeful. And so um, ultimately what happened is he still has this creative piece, but really feeling like it was probably squandered a little bit. Well, now, um, I don't know if you know about this, but um, there was a proposition in California that was just passed this last year um, and or in 2022, I think, and then gone into effect 2023. Um, but basically, Prop 28 allows um, there to be um you know, music, theater, the arts in the schools, and the state is providing a billion dollars a year for all the sc public schools in California. So this has been missing for so long, for so long. And of course, as you know, it was always just some extracurricular thing. Like that was the only way you were going to be able to get your kids involved in that, where they could have been learning it and participated in school all along, but, you know, schools only had to do it with whatever money they had left over, right? Or parents were just, you know, pulling money from their own resources to be able to get kids there and that sort of thing. So meanwhile, his beautiful story is that this year, um, because of this money, there are 80% of that money goes to teachers because now there's no art teachers. So now we're recovering. Now we have to go back Bring and back the art teachers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he's going to a title one school teaching art for next year. And he's so, oh. so excited. And his wife is on some board for the state and she's the one who's promoting it, getting all the teachers educated, all that sort of thing. So I'm wondering, is it the same in Illinois? I guess your kids all grew up in Chicago and that sort of thing. Very um, different. Now we do live in the suburbs, uh -huh. so I'm not speaking about the Chicago public schools per se, though they do have some strong art programs and art schools. Um, mm -hmm. We, the area I'm in especially, has a very robust arts program. Oh, so, that's I, and actually, we live in my, in my hometown. So I came up. I had art lessons the entire time. I went through school. Mm -hmm. um, my kids had that option. Like I said, we have this, we have an award-winning middle school theater program. And I think one of the things I love about where we live is I feel that we do a good job of, again, speaking to the different levels. So we have two incredibly strong art, uh, musical theater programs I can think about. And when people come to me and say, well, you kind of know which one I was like, well, they're both great in different ways. And it depends on your child's personality. So if you have the kid where you're trying to get them to be a little bit more drawn out because they're really shy and you want to give them that confidence, I'd recommend this program. If you have a kid who was like my middle one that you're begging them to stop singing for 10 minutes so you can take a phone call, I would suggest this other one. So asking for an agent in three. Very <laughs> yes. We're very fortunate. We, we do not have that. However, in my research for the book, what I did was I interviewed parents from all over the country. Yeah. And mm -hmm. one of the things, because I didn't want it to be skewed by this perspective of kind of what I'm doing or the yeah. parents I know who yeah. are, have kids at a professional level. And yes, that was something that was a big concern that would come up because you'd have these incredibly creative kids and they would have very limited outlets for it. Yeah. And if anything went wrong in, if they weren't getting it in school and there's only one art program they can go to, or only one musical theater program that's 40 minutes away and, and they just, yep. they don't fit in there. They haven't found their people. Parents were really stuck. Yeah. And now post COVID that did help in terms of having more online resources for these kids to have an outlet outlet and find community. And I'm so grateful for that. Yeah. But even that's not the same as, you know, on a Saturday, being able to necessarily go and hang out with your friends doing the thing that you love. Yeah. So we, I think that in some ways where we are is a little bit more of the exception than a lot of the country where mm -hmm. there just isn't the money and the resources. And yeah. Yeah. Personally, I feel like as we've moved more and more to this, lots of pressure around tests as you know, standardized testing as the measure of the end all be all, it's kind of creating this impossible situation. Because yeah. if that's how you get your money to fund the education, of course you have to teach to that, which means you don't have the money yeah. to try to incorporate this other creative side, which I feel is just as important. Mm 
And I think it's just something huge that helps kids in so many different ways. But talk about kind that. Of talk, talk a little bit about what are some of the ways that being in those creative arts can help develop skills, even if the, even if the kids are not going to be like perhaps all three of your kids in <laughs> arts for a career, but just for any kid, talk a little bit about what the, what that is doing for them and for their, just for their humanness. Bit. Yeah. I'm going to flip it just a little bit. Um, I am going to talk a little bit about if somebody wants to do it as a career and here's why, because I think it really does exemplify all the way down for all age groups. Mm-hmm. When I hear a parent say to me, my teen really, 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 really wants to go in the performing arts. That's what they want to do in college. I'm terrified. I don't think they're going to be able to find a job. They're not going to have any skills that are going to be applicable anywhere. I always just stop them. I say, yes, they are. <laughs> These skills that you learn in the performing arts are transferable in so many ways. Yes. You learn yes. public speaking. You learn collaboration. You learn patience. You learn to be vulnerable. You learn resilience. There's so many things that you are going to need in other careers that are important that you're going to learn. You learn organization, you learn time management. Mm -hmm. So when I can stop parents and say, "I, I understand what the fear is, but if the concern is that this, the pursuit of this isn't going to carry over into other areas that they can use to for to make money or when they're younger to build yeah. confidence, confidence in many different ways i say i disagree and disagree. And, and look right. at what these kids are coming out of here doing and and all the things that they have to kind of juggle in doing this yeah yeah my son my older son um began in a music program later in high school and he he we had moved a lot we because my husband's job job we'd lived in a lot of different places Um, He was kind of struggling um, when he first started in high school. And I think he was, I can't remember if it was a sophomore or junior year that he found a program. We were in Virginia at the time. It was called School of Rock. And so he started with that program. He wanted to learn guitar, but he also liked to sing. And I think, I think he had been doing, what was that rock band that was on the Wii or something? It was one of those, you know, Xbox. <laughs> yep. He'd been doing that. He liked it. It's like that kind of led in. So I don't know, I guess even, even video games sometimes. So, so he started school of rock and the, the shift in him was amazing. It was really playing guitar was the first thing that we really saw him passionate about and really sticking to and learning and practicing and then the confidence, because the, in that in that program, from the first semester, if you will, the first session they're in, they start performing at the end, doing these shows at local restaurants and out at the mall and something. And, you know, he's up there um, playing guitar and singing, <laughs> singing the lead, which is, you know, it was amazing to see him in that, to see the, the confidence that grew from it and then just uh, how much he loved it. And, and that's, that is still his passion is making music. He's had multiple bands he's doing. um, He does different projects. He collaborates, but that's, that's how he wants to, that's his passion. And so he works other jobs right now to support that, but that's his passion. And it's, it's been amazing for him. Very much my oldest, the program where he went to learn guitar was school of rock. Um, We live in a town that has one of the largest (laughs) school of rocks in the country, in the world. We rival sometimes Brazil, but yeah. um, yes. And I recommend it for that. When parents say to me, you know, my kid's having a hard time finding their people. Mm. I do recommend the arts yes. programs. I either recommend one of our musical theater programs, or I recommend a school of rock. And I explained to them why I was like, you know, those programs can take something that feels really overwhelming and large, and it makes it a smaller pool of people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And people who probably think a little bit more like you, Maybe you don't necessarily like all the conventional stuff or what you're supposed to like doing and yeah. you can really find your people. So the number of stories that I have heard from parents about this turnaround, exactly what you're describing, like my kid was struggling a little bit or a lot, and this is where they found their people. This is where they found their passion. This is where they found their support. This is where they found some confidence. This mm-hmm. is where they found a willingness to try things they've never tried before. Mm-hmm. And that's that is what I love about the arts. And that's why I'm excited when I hear something like, okay, they're bringing it back into the schools because not everybody has a school of rock or equivalent type program that they can access or that they can afford. 
Not everybody right. can afford to send their kids to all of these kinds of things. And it really can make a difference for kids. If you can take something that feels really overwhelming and a lot of people and really kind of bring them into a smaller group, then they can practice that confidence. Once you kind of have your people, you have your group, you're doing your thing, and then you're back at school, you're going to be walking with a little bit more confidence. You're going to be yes. a little more willing to talk to that person that you were a little nervous about talking to before, because, Hey, you know what? If they don't speak to me, whatever, I have friends I can hang out with in the lunchroom. It's fine. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah. That's really smart. Wow. I had never heard of school of rock, but I think I want to go. <laughs> oh, be careful what you say. They have I an know. adult program. Oh, ours is Let's do it Deb. repeatedly. <laughs> Not going to happen. <laughs> it's, yeah, and, and, and if you don't have a school of rock, there's a lot of like programs like that, that are kind of popping up now where yeah. Parents may or may not be aware of them as something that exists, but if your yeah. kid wants to go into contemporary art now, you know, it's all, again, it's what you want. And this isn't a something I talk to, I don't talk about this in the book, but I do say to parents, I'm like, well, what do you want from the program? Mm -hmm. So if your child is saying, I want to study composition, I might say to them, okay, you might want to get them in something in addition to School of Rock to ensure that they're learning to read music. Because at School of Rock, some of it's going to depend on who their teacher is in terms of how much music reading is going to be incorporated. Because that's not the model. The model yeah. is something else that I think is just as valuable. The model is we're going to get you up and performing. And you're going to yeah. think you can't, but we're going to get you up and performing. Right, right. But in order to be learning a song that quickly, if you don't walk in the door reading music, it's something different. Now, my son walked in as a pianist already reading music. Mm -hmm. So yeah. for him, he was able to kind of take that and do something different. But there's, there's lots of different programs out there. And I think sometimes for parents, if that's part of the issue is that they only know of one type of program and they think, well, that's yeah. not a good match for my child. And I just yeah. really encourage parents to do a deeper dive. Because yeah, well, and you know, creativity, tons of options. Yeah, yeah. Well, now just YouTube, right? Like my, like my son. Um, you know, he we had him in piano and all the things, and he was a little. He's really creative, sort of like your middle child. He can do everything. He does heavy metal Mondays. I'm giving him a shout out right now. <laughs> Tanner Van Horn, but um, but anyway, um, so much. He, you know, I think he had piano lessons and then maybe had two guitar lessons. But now most of what he learns is on YouTube, right? He he just had the basics, but my goodness, like for those parents who maybe can't afford to have them in lessons or whatever, you can pick up a cheap guitar and throw them on YouTube that they can learn a lot there, right? Like it's wide Absolutely. open. It's wide open. And I Sometimes parents, because they may not be as in tune to how far things have come. So they're kind of thinking of YouTube as the wild west and what, who are they learning from? What are they really yeah. going to learn? And when I say, oh no, there's people up there who will take you from lesson one, day one, all the way through. And it's pretty high quality. You oh can God. learn tons <laughs> of stuff. Yeah, you know, my, my, both of my sons have dabbled with learning production, um, starting with learning stuff off of YouTube or when they don't know how to do something, it's a great place for them to look and say, oh, somebody on here has done this. Yeah. I could do something like can do something with this. Yeah. Like you no. say, another one of those, uh, less traditional resources that's, that's making it hopefully making the arts more accessible to more people, which yeah. is a good yeah. thing. Yes. Absolutely. So besides the creativity, you know, Marcy and I, I don't know if you've seen any of of our work or what we're up to but we're really all about helping this generation of kids with um, stress anxiety depression suicidal ideation and really what we've found with the arts is that is an outlet for so many teens and tweens and young adults um, to be able to use that to be able to calm and center themselves even if they're just listening to music, right? They don't have to be able to master something. But, um, you know, I think especially those of us in the older generations who didn't have those opportunities, um, just listening to some old music can can really calm me down, right? So, um, so talk about that, being that you are a clinical psychologist and um, make some recommendations around that for parents and 
kids and families? Well, we know that music, it calms our central nervous system. So that's part of the reason it's so powerful Mm -hmm. for teens. And probably why, you know, since the advent of the Walkman, you've probably seen teens kind of shutting out the world and putting the headphones in and kind of, it's twofold. It's, I'm going to shut out stuff that is overwhelming me. Yeah. And it's calming their nervous system. I talk to teens a lot about that. I talk to teens and parents about just being able to relate to music that especially if you have a kid who doesn't like to read, this is another way to get to, to not feel so alone, to hear a story told in a different way to say, you're not the only one going through this. You don't need to feel so isolated. Other people can relate to what some of these feelings are. Mm-hmm. So I'm, and, and I will see the same thing too. I will say it's not just in music. You'll see it like with artists and drawing and painting. It's all yeah. of these things are very yeah. self-meditative. So yeah. when I say to a teen, you know, would you consider meditation? And I get the eye roll from some of them, not all of them, because it is much more mainstream now than it used to be. Yeah, but when I point out yeah. to them that they're already kind of doing their own meditation with their art. Yes. Mm-hmm. When I say, well, talk to me about when it's been a horrible day and, you know, your friend said something really mean to you and your mom's upset because you got a ding in the car and all the things are going wrong and you're pretty sure your boyfriend's about to break up with you <laughs> and you retreat to the basement and you engage in your art. One, why are you retreating to your basement to engage in your art? Well, you know, because I love it. Well, okay, so why do you love it? We start talking about what they feel and what it does. And Mm. when I can really get to the root of, it helps calm and ground and center me. I say, so it's already a form of meditation for you. That's what it is. (laughs) um, Wow. Okay. (laughs) Maybe I'll try this other form too. Because my point to them is you already know through this thing you do how to do this. You know, you have some tools to calm your nervous system when things get really intense. Yeah. Now you can't always pick up your guitar in the middle of class when something's going wrong, mm-hmm. but we, you we can train you now to use that as a bridge to how do I calm myself yeah. in this moment Yes. and yeah. feel better and soothe. So it's again, another reason I'm just so, so um, adamant about allowing kids the opportunity to explore the arts. Not all kids are going to like them, yeah. But for the ones who do, it just can be so beneficial for them in so many different ways. Yeah. It's interesting, um, Marcy and I, uh, so when we were doing these live workshops uh, with kids prior to the pandemic, we were doing, you know, journaling, is, believe it or not, is a is a form of the arts, right? Which is re- really amazing. Um, and then um, doodling. So Marcy has created pieces <laughs> on doodling. And we were talking about the evolution of, schools and some of them are still doing this but you know like you'll find a lot of kids in the classroom who are doodling right it's helping them to calm and then there are those teachers who are like oh stop that like don't be doing that in class you're being distracted right and when marcy and i are under understanding that that is how they're keeping their, themselves calmed in the classroom right yeah. so there's all, so many so many facets of, of the arts um, and just allowing your child to pick and choose and giving them the opportunity. And it, 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 like you said, it doesn't have to be, you know, classical piano instruction, right? There's, there's so many ways to use it. And honoring our children to know what's working for them. Yeah. If a child is doodling or maybe not even just doodling, maybe they're drawing these elaborate pictures. And then the teacher wants to say, you're clearly not paying attention. If you can draw this beautiful sketch, as opposed to listening to the lesson, I'm kind of like, "Mm, but you have a child who maybe has a 504 or an IEP and they're allowed to have a fidget in their hand Mm -hmm. because we, you understand why that helps them. This is the same thing for them. Yeah. Just because they're doing this doesn't mean they're listening. They're not listening. In fact, it may mean that they're better able to listen. Yes. That is that is what I was you finding know. when I was doing the research for a doodling um, piece. And and it it resonated with me deeply because I am a doodler and I can remember being even still, you know, from being in class and taking notes, but also, you know, drawing things to even, you know, in my professional life, same thing in a meeting or something, taking notes and maybe drawing. And when I look back at them, when I look at the picture I drew, I'm like, oh, that's where they were talking about this and this and this, like the, the information is, is in there. It like got retained in that place because 
and this is, you know, I, this is, I always say, I'm not the sciencey one, but I understand there's something going on in my brain and my hand and how I'm receiving that information that is, that is setting it in and making it more solid for me. And 100% um, it's, like, it's like a mnemonic device. I mean, it, yeah. it, it really does help your memory. It's the same reason we can also say to kids, you know, really try to study in the same kind of setting that you'll potentially be taking the exam in because it's going to trigger that memory in a different way. Mm -hmm. So if you can tell a story and kind of hang information on certain parts of the story, you're more likely to remember that information when you need it. For you, it's when you're doodling, you're yeah. connecting that. It's like, oh, well, I see this figure eight that I repeated. Oh, that's when they were talking about this. And that's right. They said this. And now I remember the formula. Yes. So it's, yes. it's all very connected. And I, I worked with, with one drummer who also had ADHD. And one of the issues was getting in a lot of trouble for drumming while taking tests, which of course is very distracting, but like, you know, I'm not just on the table. Yes. And me saying to the parents, I want you to go get your kid a 504. Yeah. Because this is how he's, he's doing better because he's drumming. Drumming yes. is very mathematical. Yeah. When do we hear most of the complaints is because he does it during the math tests. It helps him think it helps him remember and it's calming yes. him down. So what's the harm in just letting him take his test in the library in one of the study rooms yeah. where a librarian can see he's not cheating and right. he's not distracting anybody else. Yes. Yeah. And I love that. And, and parents going, oh, okay. This kid has all, we knew he was a drummer from the time he was little. It's like he learned <laughs> yes. what- soothed him and calmed his nervous system very quickly and very young. So learning to just honor that in our kids, yes, that they know yeah. they have a good they sense of what works them. for them and what yeah. makes them feel good. It's, it's a little hard. I have, I have something similar with a singer who probably would sing through all tests if allowed, but <laughs> <laughs> there should be, little, there should be rooms for these kids <laughs> where they can do their thing. And <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Marcy and I are, also the belief that this these these generations of kids um they do have a knowing mm -hmm. right they they have a knowing of so many things that maybe i don't know maybe we knew but we we unlearned it because we were told to right because this is the way you should learn these are the things you're supposed to learn right. um do it this way right and so us about what was acceptable and not acceptable. exactly yeah, yeah yeah they're not having it they're not having it they've which they're I not love. having it and they have this is where social media can be so wonderful because they have exposure to other voices telling them yeah. I I think the same way I feel the same way I understand the world in the same work in the same way yes that before that if you t told a child well this is not okay and right. you can't express yourself in that way, or that's not something you're supposed to be talking about, or there was nobody for them to, to, to look to necessarily and say, am I, am I crazy for thinking or feeling or doing yeah. this this way? Yeah. And it's wonderful because I think that exactly what you're speaking to is what's also then kind of, you know, synergistically working with kids, natural creativity. So they have yes. all this other kind of information and senses and way of going about the world and feeling their way through the world combined yes. with this outlet of this creativity. And it's really, I love working with these kids. Like these are some yeah. of my favorite human beings to be with are these young adults and teens who are yeah. just that they see the world in a unique way. And it's really mm -hmm. fun. Yes. Amen. <laughs> yes. So yeah. And when people say, you know, why are you so focused on this. And one of the things I always come back to is I truly believe the arts can build bridges when nothing else can. When you can't agree about anything else, you are on completely opposite sides, but all of a sudden a song comes on <laughs> and you're like, I'm really mad at you, but it's my chance. <laughs> and the person next to you is kind of like, it is kind of a good song. <laughs> oh, there is yes. a commonality. Yes. We do have something that we can both say, I think you're totally wrong, but we can both agree on this. And that's a starting point. Yes. So for me, when I look at everything that's going on, it's like, let's bring more of that. Let's look at what happened during lockdown. How did people get through it? The mm -hmm. arts. 
they yeah. were watching yeah. they were watching YouTube, they were watching Netflix, they were reading books, they were listening to mu- mu- listening to music, they were watching live concerts on YouTube. Yeah. They were yeah. using dancing this on because, TikTok. <laughs> dance yes. all all of the things because yeah. it made us feel more joy. It mm-hmm. made us feel more connected. It made us feel like less isolated. Mm-hmm. So Yes, I look at that and say, this was a perfect example of why this is so important, that yes. we give our young people the freedom to engage in the creative arts in a way that makes sense to them, if that's what they choose to do. Yeah, yes, I love that. I love that. I think wow. We're running out of time, but <laughs> what a great note to end on, just giving our kids the freedom to be themselves and to and how that all can connect and uplift all of us, which is just what we need. Love more it. of that. Yes. A lot more of that. More. Much yeah. more of it. Much yes. More of it. Yes. Thank you oh so gosh. much, Dr. Elena. We really yes. appreciate you taking the time. Thank, Thank you. you. Tell so us much. again um, the Very name of your book. <laughs> the name of my book is Parenting Talent, The Grown-Up's Guide to Supporting and Understanding Creatively Driven Teens and Tweens. Um, and that's really what it's about is how do we understand how they're thinking about things and then how do we jump in and support them? How do people find your book and, uh, or follow you or find out more about what you're doing in the world? To find uh, the, the central location for everything would be my website, which is parentingtalent.com. Super simple, just like the title of the book. Mm -hmm. And that, that's where you can access the blog. You can access, um, the book. You can access, if you'd like to work with me, there's a way to access that there. So everything's kind of centrally located there. Wonderful. Beautiful. Well, Beautiful. we'll drop all those links on the show notes too. Um, thank you so much. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. And now for a moment about meditation and how it can help you and your family to self-regulate and mindfully return to a place of calm and centeredness. Our core tools platform consists of a number of proven tools and techniques that are designed to reduce stress, anxiety, and overwhelm in spite of what's going on in your world. Meditation is just one of these powerful tools. And through a special partnership with Donna Apodoni, we have created a group of meditations available only on our platform and via Donna's own website. Here's Donna. I am changing, but not yet changed. I am complete, but not yet finished. I've dropped out, but I haven't left. I've surrendered, but I haven't quit. Hi, I'm Donna Apidoni, and I'm the person who writes and produces meditations that are used by Core Experience. We're not perfect. We're just not perfect. We have good moments. We have not so good moments. This meditation reminds us to not overthink things. Don't be too hard on ourselves. Did you do something today that you're not really thrilled with, something that maybe wasn't 100%, something that wasn't what you wanted to do, you can make up for it. You can always make up for it and balance it by doing something different and something wonderful tomorrow. Don't fret over your mistakes. Instead, just keep doing your best. And remember, whatever's happening with you right now, you can do anything you set your mind to do. My latest is not my last. I continue to explore. I continue to grow.
I continue. Donna's book called Drive Time Meditations is a collection of 183 of her purpose-driven motivators. Drive Time Meditations is available on Amazon. Thank you for listening to the Warrior Parent Podcast. You can find us at coreexperience.org. Make sure you join us next week for another informative conversation to help you and your family show up mindfully, purposefully, and joyfully with each other and in your community. Our meditation segment is produced by Donna Apodoni with music from Scott Holmes. The full collection of meditations is in Donna's book, Drive Time Meditations, available on Amazon and at DonnaApodoni.com. Thanks to Samuel Hale, LLC, for sponsoring this podcast. Technical and marketing support comes from Inspire Your Brand. Our podcast editor is Justin Beaton. Opinions expressed by guests do not necessarily reflect those of the hosts, producers, or financial supporters. I'm Debbie DeMano. And I'm Marcy Mitchell. The Warrior Parent Podcast is a production of Core Experience. If you resonate with the idea of creating a community to help support kids and families, won't you join us by following the podcast and sharing this episode? You can even write a review. It truly does take a village, and we appreciate you. Thank you for listening to the Warrior Parent Podcast, produced by Core Experience. That's our nonprofit, and I would like to tell you about something big that's coming up for us. May 2nd, 2024, is the big day of giving in the greater Sacramento area. This is a day for nonprofits to fundraise and really strive to meet their annual goals. And for the first time, Core Experience will be participating in this big event. I want to tell you a little bit about our nonprofit, Core Experience, and our Core Tools app, which brings non clinical modalities that are scientifically proven to decrease stress and anxiety to your home. They are appropriate for kids for teens, for young adults, parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, anyone who wants to lower their stress and anxiety. And our tools include heart-brain coherence, EFT tapping, meditation, yoga, bilateral tapping, art expression, nutrition, hydration, sleep protocols, and journaling. And there are more on the app. You can find out more at Core Experience. On the big day of giving, if you would like to support our vision of a calmer, more centered world with less anxiety, depression, and suicidality, please give to Core Experience on the big day of giving, May 2nd, or any day. You can go to our show notes or our website for a link and more information on how to give. We really believe in a world that has less anxiety, less stress, less suicidality, where people can show up as their authentic selves, enjoy and purpose and living their vision. We appreciate your help in getting us there. Thank you from Core Experience and the Warrior Parent Podcast.